Good morning. If I don't get a chance to say it later, happy Thanksgiving to you. So let's just check. How many are staying home for Thanksgiving? Let's just look. Yeah, and how many are traveling? All right. Well, we wish you safe travels, and I hope you get lots of, of wonderful food, good dessert, and whatever team you're rooting for, uh, I hope they win. So uh, We are in uh, Daniel chapter 5. We're in a series uh, talking about the difference. So does making God or following God really make a difference in your life? Or is it just the adding of some rules and rituals to pretty much the same person? And so we're looking at Daniel because there's a remarkable wealth and treasury of knowledge to help us unpack questions like these. And so we've been talking about things like convictions. Is there a difference in our convictions? Do we, do we just repeat what we have been handed to us by our family of origin, or do we just navigate based on our own preferences? Uh, when it comes to courage, what is the source of our courage? Is it our own competence, or is it something else? So we've been processing through what difference does faith make, and we're in Daniel chapter 5 this morning, beginning in verse 1. It says, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles, and drank wine with them. That's, that pretty much tells you everything you need to know about this party right now. While Belshazzar was drinking wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, just so you are aware, uh, when in, in ancient writings, when they would say father, they didn't always mean your literal father. This is probably his grandfather. Uh, they would refer to the more prominent family member that was your progenitor. So like uh, in, in the Jewish nation, they would say, our father Abraham. Well, he wasn't really their father's progenitor. So that's what's happening here. That the king and his nobles, his wives and concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And then suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. How many of that would freak you out? <laughs> Just right while I was talking, if suddenly a hand appeared and started writing stuff out on the wall. No one would be paying attention to me anymore. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, diviners, and he said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. This is actually another clue about uh, his, who his father is. There's actually some history here, and his father had actually stepped away from the throne and pursued spiritual pursuit in the desert. And so the reason that he can't give a position higher than third place is because technically his father is the real king. He's abdicated the throne to his son so he can make someone third highest in the kingdom. And then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew even more pale. His nobles were baffled. The queen, and this is actually referring to the queen mother, Hearing the voices of the king and his nobles came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. Sounds like something a mother would say, isn't it? There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. That's a useful set of skills right there. 
call for Daniel. He will tell you what the writing means. This was no ordinary party. There are levels of opulence, inebriation, and arrogance on display that even stretch the boundaries of what was allowed in Babylon. There's a thousand nobles that have been gathered. Wine is flowing like a river. And it says on more than one occasion in this chapter that the wives and the concubines were brought in to participate in the party. Even by ancient Babylonian standards, this was excessive. Then they dragged out the treasures of previous conquests, maybe trying to relive a memory of a better time. And while they're drinking and using these treasures, Belshazzar has an idea. You should always be suspicious of ideas that are born out of a party when you're drunk. He will bring the gold cups that were part of the worship of the Jewish God and use them to worship his own gods. So the question is, why is there such a hedonistic display going on in this party? And that is a really good question. And not just for this party, but any time we're in a place where it seems like the wheels are off and everything's over the top. You see... People don't just go to parties to celebrate. Sometimes they go to parties to escape. Don't get me wrong. There are things worth celebrating. Like when people make the most important promises they've ever had to another human being, and they promise to be with that person for the rest of their lives, that's worth celebrating. Or the birth of a child, that's worth celebrating. Or completing a significant accomplishment successfully, that's worth celebrating. Sometimes we just get through something and we want to take a little time off. But sometimes we don't do things well. We feel like we failed. Some relationship blew up and we want to feel better. So we equate that with forgetting. If I can forget for a few minutes, I will feel better. There's a little bit of backstory here. It might be worth mentioning. Not all of the historical context of what's occurring right now is included in the text we looked at. There are other sources in history that reveal some of the things that's going on. There's another great kingdom that's rising, and the king of that kingdom is Cyrus, and he has a military that is conquering lands at an alarming rate. He had a formidable, formidable military, and there actually was a conflict between his military and Belshazzar's military only just a few days before this, about a two-day's journey away from Babylon. Belshazzar's troop suffered a horrible loss. They just got defeated. So Babylon, because of these losses, is now wanting to distract I mean, in a kingdom like that, when you've got all these nobles, you could probably be concerned that they might start cutting deals with the kingdom that is coming instead of staying faithful to the one that's in place. Get everybody together. Have fun music. Get plastered. And romanticize the past. Tell stories about when you did something that mattered or at least something that was celebrated. And that's what they're doing. And in a setting like this, you will begin to see what people really worship. Gold and silver. For us, that's money and the things it buys. Things that make us feel successful and secure. Stone and wood. These are building materials for structures and monuments. Things that make us feel significant and safe. Iron and bronze. These are the things they use to produce weapons. The things that make us feel powerful and respected. And in that environment, what they really worship is on display. The party's going really strong when all of a sudden a hand appears and begins to write words on the wall. Everything stopped. It's not something you can ignore. If you've heard the phrase, the writing is on the wall, this is the story it comes from. I'm not making that. That's, this is really where it comes from. The writing is on the wall, and it means something unpleasant or difficult is going to happen, and you can't stop it. This is not what we want. Everybody in the room is suddenly sober. 
in, in my mind, I don't just see it like ink on a wall. I see God just using his fingernails, scratching it right into the plaster. By the way, the words were, mine, mine, tikal, parson. Or as my little sister used to say in Sunday school, meanie, meanie, you tickled your Pharisee, which is not the same thing. <laughs> Raises a really important question, I think. If God were going to write words on the wall for everybody to read, why not make it clear? No one knows what the words mean. No one knows what the words are. I think this is one of the challenges of our spiritual journey. I want God to write it out for me all the time. I don't want to guess. I don't want to wait. I don't want to work. I don't want to worry. I just want the answer. And God has ways of not doing things exactly the way we prefer. So the king brings in all of his wise men, asks them. They have no answers. Uh, by the way, our culture does the same thing. Something devastating happens. Something very discouraging happens. And what do we do? We get all the people that we think are experts and we put them on TV. We put them under lights. We put a microphone in their face and we start asking them questions. Cultures really haven't changed that much, just technology. So I'd like to talk for a few minutes. I know you're worried because I'm 11 minutes into the talk and we haven't gotten to the first point yet. So I'd like to point out that my messages the last two weeks have been unusually short. <laughs> and I hear you all have a couple of days off this week, so. <laughs> So the coping mechanisms of culture, as a rule, not just Western culture, around the world, across generations. When we want to cope with things we don't like, we just try to get numb. And man, are there a lot of options for that. I'm not referring to medication that might be prescribed by a professional to help bring some balance and traction to actually dealing with issues in your life. I'm talking about the ways we medicate ourselves. We can use food or alcohol, psychostimulants, Cannabis, opioids, opiates. And this is the thing. When you're medicating yourself, there are little towels. There's a kind of isolation that starts creeping into our lives and a secrecy about what we're doing. And our emotions tend to get a little bit out of balance, particularly the angry one. We just want to numb ourselves because it doesn't feel good. Stop the pain. The second option that we tend to do is just try to get more. Just, if I had more then, and we just fill in the blank, we, we, have, we have an answer to that in our own heads. It's a common option in our culture. If I have more, then maybe I'll be worth more. If I have more, maybe others will think more of me. And so, it's not just that we want things. Because there's something we think those things are going to provide for us. If I can just get more, I can get that, and that's what I really want. And then, thirdly, we try to get out. It's a coping skill in our culture. Just run away from things you would rather avoid. Run away from commitments. Run away from responsibilities. We call that a free spirit, but it's not free if you can't stand up to anything. So is that all faith really does for us? Because there are some people who use these kinds of options in their faith, too. They just put religious symbolism and religious-sounding words on top of it. They want God to numb them to what's going on in their lives. They just want more in their life, and they just assume that God has come with a great escape clause so that we don't have to actually go through all of this stuff in life. Please understand, God has not broken into our world and extended his grace to us so that we could avoid reality. That's not why he's here. So what difference does faith make? What different set of skills? And what I would say is the first coping skill for a faith-based person is just start with humility. Start there. Start with humility. It's really interesting. Daniel comes in. I didn't read the text. He finally is brought in, and he sees the words on the wall, and he knows what they are, and he knows what they mean. But he doesn't start with the interpretation. He starts telling the context of something this king needs to know. And he said, you know, your progenitor, Nebuchadnezzar, was one of the greatest kings that's ever ruled on a throne in human history. 
That man could do whatever he wanted, and it went to his head. And he considered, he became so prideful and so arrogant that something snapped in his life. He lost his capacity to reason. He couldn't dwell among people. He couldn't even eat food like a normal human. He wound up just letting his hair and his fingernails grow long, and he lived out in the field and ate grass like an ox until the day he humbled himself before God. And that day, all of his reason was brought back. He had to humble himself. He starts with the context, not the interpretation. Pride is a funny thing. It's very easy to spot in others, very hard to spot in ourselves. Pride kind of becomes preoccupied with how do I look? Pride can be a little judgmental about how other people look. Pride can be, give birth to bitterness because we think things like this. Well, if I was in their position, I would always or I would never. And then now you can be bitter. Pride produces guilt. It's very hard to forgive yourself when you have pride because you feel like you have to earn the forgiveness. You have to pay the price. And so you carry around all this guilt, and pride makes you think that you're exempt from consequences that other people experience when they're doing things that are destructive to them. Well, I know that happened to them, but it'll be different for me. Okay. Can, can I just tell you something? Whatever that rationale is in your head, that's what pride sounds like to you. Pride never comes in and says, I'm pride. Pride hides itself really well. So we have to start from the position of humility. We have to recognize that we have limits. We have to recognize that there are things that may be a part of our life that are actually working against our capacity to experience life to the full. For example, maybe we're a little bit selfish, and selfishness drives people away. And that could be addressed before the writing is on the wall. Or apathy, where we just waste one opportunity after another. And it could be addressed before the writing is on the wall. Some people use sex either to feel better about themselves or to control another person. It does incredible violence to the human heart. And our, our culture just gives carte blanche action to, for this. No, no, nothing's out of bounds. And, and somebody could speak into our lives before the writing is on the wall. There are things we don't know. There are things we don't understand. There are things that we misunderstand. And if we start with humility, we can learn. We can learn from what we're in, not just run from what we're in. That's a really powerful thing. Second coping skill in a faith-based person is that we seek wisdom. See, I think there are people already in or near our lives who want what's best for us, and they're willing to challenge us. But it takes a lot of humility to call for a Daniel and let him speak into your life. I've been doing ministry in life for quite a while now, and I've noticed that when a marriage is struggling, how often people don't go to a marriage that's healthy to ask for counsel. They go to these people who are really relationship serial killers. <laughs> and they ask them, so what should I do? Their, their options are pretty much going to be cut and run, attack and destroy, get out of Dodge while you can. There are people who've managed money really well. There are, there are people who have, have taken care of their body. They're not trying to, to carve something to put on display. They just know how to manage their physical being well. And here's the challenge for us, is that our tendency is to look at people who are succeeding at something and then feel as though we would be judged if we opened up our lives to them. We actually avoid the very people who can provide the most insight and wisdom for us. We've got to learn to seek wisdom. And then thirdly, Accept grace. I know you're feeling better now because I've been plowing through these points really good. <laughs> Thanksgiving will be on time. <laughs> grace understands that there are things in my life I have not earned. I didn't create opportunity. I just took advantage of it. I didn't create my capacity. I just developed it. I didn't create my ability to reason. I just put it into play. 
all of those things comes from God, the most gracious being in the universe. That's astonishing. This is how Paul wrote it in Ephesians. He said, it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not of works, so that no one can boast. See, what's true is we have a different king than King Belshazzar. Our king wasn't dragging everything out to make himself look good. Our king emptied himself of all the treasure of heaven. Our king gave up his glory so we could experience the glory of God. Our king gave his life so that we could have life. Our king takes on our unrighteousness and he exchanges it for his righteousness. The cross reminds us not of what we have done for God, but what God has done for us. It's grace. Now, here's what's interesting. Our world is filled full of people with lots of advice. How many have heard some of them? How many are some of them? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it's an age thing. Maybe. I've just gotten weary of the voices that are always shouting about what we should and shouldn't do. And since they have no authority on their own, they claim to speak for God. And in my experience, no one's life has changed because of that. If anything, it just feels like more distance is driven between people who could connect with God and others. What if, instead of telling people what they should or shouldn't do, we just lived out our humility we acknowledged our own limitations. There was a very, very famous celebrity who had something of a spiritual experience. And there was a big award party. And it was out on the West Coast. And everybody who was anybody was there. And all the cameras were on. It was a stunning display. And they asked this person if they were going. And they said that they weren't. And I braced myself waiting for the the usual rant against the excesses that they used to do. And it's not what she said. And I was so grateful. What she said was, there are deep weaknesses inside of me. I tend to do things and be places and make decisions that are unwise and unhealthy for me. And when I do that, it hurts me and it hurts the people I love the most. I'm not strong enough to be in a place like that yet. And I thought, what an amazing display of humility. She didn't tell anybody what they should or shouldn't do. She just said, this is what's, what's true about me. There are people who, when we seek wisdom, they'll notice that you don't have to run and hide from your problems, but you can actually talk to other people who know something about them and learn from them. And that when we live out the grace of God, we don't talk like, yeah, I am where I am because I worked really hard and I made a really serious decision and I've kept my, my faithfulness to God. It, it doesn't sound like that. What it sounds like is, I found God and he found me and he's changing my life one day at a time. And I can't believe the difference he's making in me. I'm so grateful for it. And when we talk like that, it gives people hope that they don't just have to be in a constant, non-ending, repetitive cycle of what they've always known up to this point. And maybe, just maybe, if we live like this, if we live out of humility and we seek wisdom and we accept grace, just maybe, maybe, we can be a different kind of handwriting on the wall. Maybe we can tell people that there is a kingdom that will never end. Because that's what the word meaning means. It means it's over. Tikal. There's nothing significant that has happened. Everything is weightless. And it's dust in the wind. 
person. Everything you have will be broken and divided and other people will pick up the pieces. And maybe we have a different handwriting to share. There is a kingdom that never ends. That we can do things that last for eternity. And then instead of being broken and divided, we can be made whole again. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, um, well, the tendency of our heart is to cope with things in ways that humans always have. I mean, the pain is real. It's not pretend. Stuff really hurts. Not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally. And we often feel trapped. And we just assume if, if our houses or our apartments were fuller, our life would be too. Father, when we think rationally about that for even a minute, we know humans have been trying this for a long time. And, and we get so tired. And where we go from there it just does such damage to us it brings so much grief to others would you help us just start today by recognizing this stuff I don't know I'm not all-knowing. I'm not all-powerful. I'm, I'm just trying to figure things out. If we start from there, you can do so much. If we'll seek wisdom, that the, there are Daniels you have placed in our lives, if we're willing to hear their voice, that there are things we don't understand and you choose to speak through someone else rather than directly to us. And that grace can flow like a river into our lives instead of the things that we try to numb ourselves with. And it makes all the difference to us, in us, and around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.